Wonderful. Thank you so much. Madhvi and Jonah, really great to have those voices up on the stage and to hear what God is doing and uh, trusting for that enthusiasm to boil over into all of our lives. A um, bit of a hard act to follow, actually, now that I'm up here. Um, such uh, just grace and enthusiasm for God and for His kingdom and uh, wonderful to have those voices as part of this church community. So we are, as uh, mentioned, in the middle of a series called Experiencing God. It's something that we're doing personally. There's a workbook we go through day by day, engage with God in a devotional way. There's weekly group studies where we have a video and some discussion around the theme. And then there's this Sunday service where we're talking about some of the themes that we're discussing in the course around our relationship with God. And the theme for this week coming, the week coming up, is love and God's invitation. It was so great to have said preaching last week about God's desire to have a love relationship with us. This idea that we're not in some kind of religion, some kind of pattern, some kind of tradition, uh, but we've joined something, if you're a Christian, because of a faith in a living God, and that He loves you, that He knows you, that He wants to have a relationship with you. And so as we consider our relationship with God, we, we're not talking about a God who's kind of standing behind us with a big stick, you know, trying to beat us into doing the things He wants us to do. He's also not a God standing in front of us with a huge carrot, you know, like a giant Father Christmas saying, be a good boy, be a good girl, and then I'll give you this great big reward. He doesn't treat us in either of those ways. Neither does He run around after us saying, well, what do you want to do with your life? Well, let me try and help you become all that you want to be. Instead, He loves us with an undying, passionate love, and He invites us to join Him in His world, in His mission, in His desire, in His purposes for this world. And so that's what I'm speaking about this morning, God inviting us into this love relationship and using us or speaking to us about His kingdom and His work for our lives as we do that. When I think about that theme, I think about lovers inviting each other into their world. Now, I'm not sure if you've all read the Song of Solomon in the Bible, but there is a great love book in the Bible. It is deeply passionate. It is poetic. It's rich. It's so full of kind of expressive love between a beloved and a lover, a man and a woman who's kind of uh, reaching out to one another in this deep sense of love. It's a picture of human love. It's also a picture of God's love for His people. And it's worth reading if you've never read that book. It's a short book in the middle of the Bible. But I just want to read to you one little section from Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 8 to 13. As the, beloved, the lover comes to his beloved, uh, and she is watching him. Listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter's past, the rains are over and gone, flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come, the cooing of doves is heard in our land, the fig tree forms its early fruit, the blossoming vines spread their fragrance, arise, Come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. There is this lover, he's approaching his beloved. He's looking at her through the window of the house, and he's got this desire for her to join him in his life. He's the king, this uh, lover. He's got the whole kingdom before him. He's, his vast lands, he's kind of the, the oversight of what he has under his control, the herds, the flocks, the armies, and all these things. And here he is speaking to his beloved through the window of the house, Come, come, I want to show you all that there is that's in my life. I'm inviting you to participate in this incredible kingdom that I now currently rule and that you can be part of in the exercise of what I want to do in this kingdom. I love you and I want you to be part of what I am doing. It's the words of a lover. Isn't it attractive, this sense of this deep love relationship, this passion, this desire? I don't want to do this on my own. I want you to be part of it. I want you to feel what I feel and to experience what I experience. And at that point in time, the beloved has an opportunity to respond, isn't it? She's there inside her house. She's, she's got the opportunity. Am I going to go? Am I going to be part of this 
invitation that I'm being invited into. Am I going to be part of this expression of love? Am I going to see what this man is doing and how to share my life with him? Or am I going to resist that love? And if you read the book as a whole, you will find that this couple find each other in deep and intimate ways and they have an amazing uh, love relationship. But it's not always perfect. In Song of Songs chapter 5 and verse 2, uh, this woman again is at home and she says, I slept but my heart was awake. Listen, my beloved is knocking open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. And then she responds, I've taken off my robe, must I put it on again? I've washed my feet, must I soil them again? My beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening, my heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolts. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had left, he was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called out to him, but he did not answer. And in that one moment of their relationship of love, as this lover had come to her, invited her, wanted to be with her and to bring her into his uh, kingdom and all that he was doing, in that one moment, her response was, I, look, it's not the best time right now. <laughs> I'm already in bed. Like, I have to get up now and go with you. What are you? Like, it's just not the greatest opportunity. I wasn't expecting you right now. Like, you know, did you have to knock on the door now? Couldn't you have come tomorrow, warned me, phoned me before? Tell me that this is her initial response. But then as she began to feel the sense of, oh no, this invitation is wonderful. This is the person I want to be with. This is the life I want to have. By the time she responds, the opportunity is gone. He's gone. Opens the door. Where is he? Calls out. Where are you? Where are you? She lost that one moment of opportunity to be part of what he was doing, her lover. Isn't that so true of us many times? We have this God who loves us so deeply and so passionately, pours out his love for us day after day after day, offers his son as a sacrifice to forgive us our sins, comes to us through our day, prompting, stirring, reminding us of something. What about you know this that I'm doing? What about that person that you could reach out to? And all of a sudden we think, well, it's not really the greatest time. You know, I'm about to go out. I can't phone that person now. And so many things that come into our mind, so many practical issues of daily life. And we say, well, not right now, God. And then he comes again and again and again. And many times, it's by the time we realize, oh, it's him. And I've got something I can do for his kingdom. The moment is gone and we lose that opportunity. Not all opportunity. It's not all lost. We've lost our life. Not like that. But we've lost that moment, that where we could have done something for God and for his kingdom, where he's invited us to be part of his great work in this world. And we've missed it. Isn't it? If you feel, if you can feel that from a lover's perspective, feel that, like you've poured out your love, you've invited the person you love into your world, and there's just a, like a very half-hearted response, well now, you know, like how hurtful is that? Like, you know, I, I, I'm, I want you to come with me, be with me, I've done so much. And we do that so often to our God who loves us so deeply and so passionately. And the purpose of this week, this week as we go through experiencing God, is He loves you and He's inviting you and He's looking for that love response. What are you going to do when He calls you to participate in His work? But it's not the only way that we can think about God's invitation in terms of His love. The other kind of picture that comes to mind is, is Jesus when He was calling His disciples because He invited them to come to work with him on his mission. It's amazing for me to think about those New Testament stories. I always try and place myself in the story of what's going on there and to think of Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee and these fishermen out there, hardened fishermen, fishing for their livelihood. And he just says, you know, come follow me. Like he invades their career, invades their working space. Picture God walking into your law office bullshit or that amazing linen factory, Jerome. And walking up to him and saying, hey, come follow me. You're busy with all the stuff you've got to get done. Everything that's so demanding on your life. And Jesus just comes with his image to hey, come and follow me. And it's amazing what he does and what he expects from us as he does that. I want to read to you a little bit out of John chapter 1. 
It's the early part of Jesus beginning his ministry and his invitation. Just a few examples of this in verse 35 of John chapter 1. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon's Peter, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found Jesus of Nazareth, the, oh, sorry, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. What I love about Jesus that he doesn't bother to explain anything at this point in his ministry. I mean, he is coming to do something radical. He's coming to completely change their perception about God, about what it means to have a relationship with God, about religion, about tradition, about sacrifices. He's going to turn all of that on its head. He's going to teach them in ways that they've never heard before, understanding things from the scriptures that they don't know even exist. He's going to perform miracles, drive out demons, raise the dead. He's going to change the world completely. He doesn't explain any of that to them. He doesn't give them kind of a heads up. This is what I'm inviting you into. Do you want to be part of it? These are the conditions. This is how it's going to work. This will be the consequence for your life. Nothing. Just comes into their world. I'm Jesus. I'm the Messiah. Will you come with me? And what I love about the disciples is that it's enough for them. They see this man Jesus, the God man. One who came down from heaven and they recognize in Jesus there is something special about this man. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. They don't understand that fully, but they know enough to say, I'm going to respond to your invitation. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to see what you do in your kingdom. I'm going to hear your teaching and I'm going to respond. I'm going to participate in the miracles and the wonders and the signs. I'm just, I'm in. I'm responding to your invitation and the love that you've shown me by coming into my life to call me to yourself. And Andrew and Philip, the two disciples that are mentioned here, they start immediately doing what Jesus is doing. They think, well, okay, Jesus is inviting people to follow him. I'm going to do the same. Andrew spent like a few hours with him in the afternoon. The first thing he does, the first thing he does, the Bible tells us, is he goes to find his brother Peter. Hey, Peter, you've got to come with me. I'm doing what Jesus is doing. He's inviting people. I'm inviting you. This is the way it works. Come and meet this man and live, be acquainted. Come to know the Messiah. Philip does the same thing. He says, I've got to make Nathaniel. He's out there sitting under the fig tree. No idea why Nathaniel was sitting under the fig tree. But there he was, Philip's mate. And Philip goes to find Nathaniel, Nathaniel, come, come and meet Jesus. Nathaniel's not that enthusiastic. Nazareth is not a very, you know, um, attractive place. It's got no profile in the Middle Eastern world whatsoever. Nothing good happens in Nazareth. I'm not sure this is a good idea, but Philip is not to be deterred. He says, come and see for yourself. That picture of what they're just doing in this few short verses here is exactly the theme that we're learning about and experiencing God this week. God is on a mission, sending Jesus into this world to turn religion on its head and to invite people into a relationship with God. And he starts by inviting one or two people to join him on that mission. And those that join him, this think this is how it works. God is doing this mission. He's inviting people. So I'm going to do the same. I'm going to invite someone to be part of this mission. I'm going to do what Jesus is doing. Live my life in line with the mission of Jesus. Do you know that every time, I think every time you meet Andrew in the pages of the New Testament, He's bringing someone to Jesus. Every time. Happens at the feeding of the 5,000. You know that massive crowd that's gathered there? Jesus is preaching. 
Everyone's getting worried. The disciples are getting worried. There's no food here. Jesus, like, send these people away, you know. Let them find something for themselves. Jesus says, no, no, not uh, going to do that. Andrew's the one that finds a little boy with whatever it is. Five loaves, two fish, two fish. Uh, I, can't, I can never get that right. You know, that's <laughs> one or the other. He brings him to Jesus. And he even says, as he brings him to Jesus, I, like, how far will they go among so many? You know, like, I don't know what, you know, you can do with this. But anyway, the way it works is you bring people to Jesus. That's the way it works. That's the mission that Jesus is on. I'm just bringing this boy to Jesus. And 5,000 people get fed that day with multiple food left over. Right at the end of Jesus' mission. It's in Jerusalem at the great feast. And it's about to be betrayed and to go through his crucifixion and his passion. And something happens in that feast at Jerusalem. There's some Greek people and they're searching for Jesus. They're not Jews. They're not part of that religious system. They're from outside, but they've heard about Jesus and something about him attracts them and they want to know who this man is that's turning religion on his head. And what happens is that, um, oh, I didn't write the reference down. They, they come to someone and they tell that person and then that person goes to Andrew. And Andrew goes and tells Jesus, hey Jesus, there's Greek people looking for you. Every time you meet Andrew, he's looking to introduce people to Jesus. He's learned how the mission works. This is what God is doing. That's what I'm doing. That's how the kingdom of God advances. Just an incredible, incredible invitation that Jesus makes out of his love relationship with you to be part of his kingdom. Now you might be sitting here this morning and thinking, awesome for Andrew, Philip, you know, all these people. What about me in my ordinary life? How on earth do I know what God is doing around me and how I should respond to that invitation of love? It's quite personal in a way. It's quite practical. And uh, it's hard, you know, to kind of uh, make a general statement that applies to everyone. This is how you respond to God in your life. If you remember Moya preaching a couple of weeks ago and saying that in her new job, as she kind of received that job and accepted that job as part of the provision for their family and for their university season and things, also she's been stirred to kind of think, well, what's God doing in this workplace and how can I be part of it? And it's a very personal story. Nobody else of us is in that workplace. No one else knows or is interacting with people, can say exactly what God is doing and how to respond. It's a personal journey. If it comes to every area of life, family or relationships or work or whatever it may be, all of us, there's an element of it being unique. Some way in which each one of us has to find our own way with God, to pray, to seek Him, to hear His voice and to understand how we can respond and to work with Him in our family or in our work or whatever it may be. But there is this one area where we are all together, the church, this local community. And I want to share a little bit about practical application here in this community, which I hope will be encouraging to you and a blessing to you, and also uh, might encourage you in the sense that you're already doing many things, and it's just a continuation of that in other areas of your life. And part of what I want to share with you is an announcement, because on the 23rd of May last year, 2021, it was a Sunday, we announced that we were going to go ahead with our building project. And that we were raising a budget of like 4 million rupees at that stage. It became 5 million by the end. But we had this vision, this faith, and that's when we made our announcement. The 23rd of May, we opened the building fund. Today I'm telling you, the building fund is closed. All the funds that we've needed has been raised and they're in the account or being paid out to the things. The building fund is closed. How awesome is that? Some of you may not have been around here at the time, but the building ended right here where I'm standing. Is that right? Yeah. Right here where I'm standing. It was this block here. There was no kids' ministry area. We were using containers that were converted out that side. And uh, this is kind of a result of all that's happened over the last year. And it's really wonderful and miraculous to me <laughs> that we've come to that place in the season that we've been in. And I was looking last night, I was re-watching a video, it's on our YouTube channel. If you're not connected to Redeemer, we have a YouTube channel, you should become a follower. Because, you know, sometimes there's some great videos that come out there. And if you look at that video, 
you'll find on that channel a video where Bolshan and Sarah interview the elders, the leadership team, saying, like, how on earth did you come to this decision? <laughs> Like, and everyone is sharing something of what God spoke to them, what God did in their lives, how kind of we came to the place that we decided this is what God is doing. And we want to just be a part of it. We want to share in what God is doing. I don't think any one of the leadership team on their own would say, this is what I wanted to do. Or all of us would say, this is what I maybe didn't want to do, but this is what it's clear God wanted us to do. And so we did it. Followed in his footsteps, did what he asked us to do. It started way before we even thought about that. The beginning of 2021, we had a verse for the year. I don't think we've ever had a verse for the year in Redeemer Church for I've been here, but that year we had a verse for the year. It's from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now unto him is able to do immeasurably more than everything we can ask or think or imagine. That's something God gave us before we even started. And then we start kind of down this process. It looks like there's definitely an opportunity and it seems like the timing is right. And I'm just reminding some of the background to kind of what happened and how we responded to God in this local church that you're a part of. Carlo came with a verse from Matthew. It says, um, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. As we began to talk about this, this is some of the words, the messages that we felt God was speaking about. Said reminded us of Isaiah 54, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Don't hold back. Moya shared on that video, she was reminded about that scripture where, you know, um, Abraham and Sarah are very old and there's a promise of a baby. And it seems completely impossible and totally ludicrous, even laughable. And Sarah laughed when the angel told Abram, you're going to have a child by this time next year. And in the response, God said to her, is anything too difficult for God? That was the response to Sarah and the response to us as we began to look at this um, building project. Lee brought the scripture from Exodus 36, and when they were building the tabernacle, and people were donating for the tabernacle to be built, and there was too much stuff. And they had to tell the people to stop giving because there's too much stuff to build the tabernacle. Now, I can tell you at certain stages of the building project, I was, um, you know, I would have been happy with enough. (laughs) Not more than enough, do you know what I mean? Coming towards the end of last year, early this year, the budget had grown to five million, that we weren't quite as close as we thought to kind of finishing the building project. I mean, I'll be satisfied with enough. But Lee brought that scripture at the beginning, more than enough. And right now the church is in a healthier financial position than we were before we started the building project. It's done. It's more than enough. There's a famine in the land. Lee, all these scriptures, there's a famine in the land. And Isaac sowed in the famine and then he reaped in the year of the famine. All the questions that are right and should be asked Why are you building a building when the COVID pandemic is ravaging the world, when people have lost their jobs and businesses are in real trouble, and now you want to raise four or five million rupees? Why would you do that? And then there's a verse in the Bible that says, in the year of a famine, Isaac sowed and he reaped, and something happened as a result of that. Cheryl shared about Noah. The time when there was no rain, <coughs> building an ark, building an ark, building an ark, no sign of rain, no rain. We built this building when there were no public meetings, no gatherings, no one to come and fill this place. When would we meet again? Would we ever be able to meet in large numbers again? None of those questions we could really answer at the time, but we heard about the story of Noah. No rain, nothing, just build the ark, get on with the job. And God has done an amazing thing, for me, a miraculous thing. So I feel like it's impossible, humanly speaking, to raise 5 million rupees to do a project like this and just to stand debt-free, full of wanting to do God's purpose and His work. And you have done that. I want to really thank, as we close the building off, from everyone that's contributed, whether it's been financially, whether it's been through prayers, whether it's been through just encouragement in the process, We've received donations from overseas, donations from other churches. This morning I sent messages out to thank them for their contribution, their partnership, because the project is finished, the the money has been raised. But I want to also speak 
about the why of them. Because when we come to doing something like this, responding to God, God is doing something and we're just invited to be part of it. That's how it feels. God decided you want to have a bigger building here, a more established place for his community, and we just invite us to be part of that. And the reason for that is so that many people can be reached and find a relationship with God. It's so that every one of those chairs that are still standing on the side can have to be put out, you know. That one Sunday morning, all those places will be full and somebody else will walk in the back and someone will say, Sid, we don't have a chair, Sid. Can you grab a chair over there? And Jerome, like, can you put a pile of chairs over there? Because... There's more people that need to hear about Jesus to come into a relation. That's the reason. That's the mission. And so as much as we're part of the story of God just putting up bricks and mortar, that's just, that's a simple part in a way. It's like a, a physical part. But the big work now is to respond to the mission of God on this world and say, I want to be a contributor to the mission of God, the expansion of the gospel, the love of God reaching somebody else in Mauritius. I personally want to be responsible for someone filling some of those chairs, at least. I want to be part of that mission that God has done. It's the work that God is doing. I'm totally confident of it because why would this building be here if God wasn't wanting to fill it? Why would He have called us to raise those funds and to go through all that pressure and stress if it wasn't because He's determined, determined, absolutely passionate, zealous, about reaching this community around us and telling people about His love and determined to bring them into a relationship with Him. Why? <coughs> he's given you and I the opportunity. It's like He's that lover coming to our house, standing at the window, saying, look at my earth. Look at the beauty of the people of Mauritius. Look at this nation where you live. Look at the wonder, the personality, the life, the vibrancy. Look at the brokenness, the, the, the fallenness. The wickedness, the evil. Look at the world around you. Come and join me in my mission. Come and be part of what I'm doing. Come and participate by inviting someone into the space where they can enjoy a relationship with God. It's not only about that. And one of the other things, our reasons, I feel God has kind of brought us into this space is to mature as a local church. If you read through the New Testament story, and you read through the book of Acts and you'll find churches get planted. They're small communities. There are people who kind of ordinary people like you and I. And suddenly it begins to grow. Leaders begin to get appointed. And it becomes a base through which the mission expands. And what's happened in Mauritius is that we've often viewed ourselves as kind of the, the object of mission. You know, We have teams that come in to help us and we're grateful for all those teams. There'll be more teams coming in this year. We kind of receive the funds that other churches have given to help us build this building. But I feel part of the expansion, part of the longer term stability here in this place is to say, okay, Redeemer Church, you're growing up now. You're growing up now. You've got a part to play in the global mission. So wonderful to have people come to the conference in Durban. Nine of us, I think next year, maybe 20, right? Come on, guys. February. I'm just giving you advance notes. February. Cape Town. What could be more beautiful than that next year? It would be so wonderful to go and join with churches from all over the world, worshipping God together, using foreign tongues, meeting other people, and celebrating the goodness of God in the world. Wouldn't it be wonderful to take funds from this church and donate them to a building project somewhere else in the world? Wouldn't it be great to send some of our leaders to preach in other churches, to support, to, to take mission teams, to evangelize, whatever it is, to be part of the global mission. That's the story that God has invited us into. Of course, we're going to keep doing our local work here. This last month, we, we put 50,000 rupees into the SOS village to help them, to sustain that orphan foster care that they're doing. We've just participated in a project at Cheshire Homes here in Black River. We are working locally with the community, and we always will. But also the reach of the gospel, but also our global partnership. There's something God is calling us to be part of, and you can play a part. I can't speak to you about how specifically to respond to God in your personal life. I can't tell you what God is doing in your workplace, or in your family, or in your relationships, or in your, any other area that you need to hear God and to respond to Him, to His invitation. You have to do that. But as part of this church community, there's many things that God is doing that we can participate in, and you are already participating in. How can you help as we walk forward on this journey? Well, one thing you can do 
is take your personal relationship with God seriously. Create some spiritual momentum in your life that makes someone who lives around you jealous. Think like, what is going on? I want some of what you've got. If you haven't downloaded the book, download, come and talk to me. I can give you a code. You can download that book. You can just get in part of the journey. Or you might say, well, I haven't, I've, I've missed out a whole lot of days. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Just download the book and start the journey. You might say, well, I'm definitely going to miss some days in the future. It's okay. It's not about ticking every box. It's about getting on the journey. It's about taking your own spiritual life personally to such an extent that someone around you says, hey, why don't you tell me what's happening in your life because I need some of that in my life. Look for an opportunity to share your faith or to pray for someone or to just show some loving kindness to someone around you. Volunteer, serve, give, pray. The building fund is closed, but we're still exercising a lot of things through the resources of the church to bless and to minister and to do the ministries. Um, so the finances are still open, but the building fund is closed. Join a team. If we send someone, take a team. Jerome went to meet a pastor in Seychelles, isn't it, recently? <coughs> awesome. Meet another pastor. <laughs> take some people with you to Madagascar. Even if it's business, just take someone with you. Say, let's just pray. Even if we're going to just walk around and just pray for this city or this place or this country. Let's do something for God and for His kingdom. God wants a love relationship with you. He's poured out His love and His passion. As said, preached to us last week. He loves you with a deep and everlasting love. He so desires you to walk in a personal relationship with Him. He wants you to hear His voice, to respond to Him when He invites you and to go on an incredible adventure of advancing the kingdom of God. I personally want to be part of it as much as I possibly can. Can we bow our heads and moment to pray? Father, we thank you so much for the Bible. Thank you for the stories of Andrew, Lord. He's an unknown disciple, hardly gets mentioned a lot, but what a beautiful man always taking people to Jesus. Thank you for the Song of Solomon, the deep passion in those words, the complete commitment to one another, the desire to love us so deeply and to share your world with us that we might be part of the rule of your kingdom. Thank you for Redeemer Church. Who are we, Lord? We just... A community on the west coast of Mauritius. It's an island so small, it sometimes doesn't even appear on the map. But you've taken notice of us. You spoke to us about extending this book. You invited us to join in, and, and by your grace we did. And we're so grateful for the privilege of sharing the joy of your kingdom advancing on the island. And so, Lord, today we offer ourselves to you again. We say, whatever you're doing, we want to be part of it. If you call us and it's inconvenient, please help us to get over ourselves and get in with you and whatever you're doing. Grant us power, courage and boldness beyond ourselves. Even as you've supplied the resources for the building, won't you supply the resources for every task that you've called us to do? Won't you raise up leaders, worship leaders and youth leaders and preachers and people that change uh, the face of this earth by helping the poor. Here, do it here, Lord. And let us be part of your kingdom advancing in so many different ways. We yield our lives to you. We give ourselves to you afresh. And we say, take us with you, Lord. We want to be where you are. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you for the amazing worship team. Really wonderful to worship God together. There's incredible cakes and coffee and things out there. You would be crazy to leave, go straight to your car. This is an awesome place and awesome people. And if you want to speak to me about the book or a group, I'm available here in the front afterwards. God bless you and have an amazing, amazing week. Thank you.